So, uh, welcome to Nebraska JS. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, metaprogramming in JavaScript. So, uh, if we look at a definition of metaprogramming from Wikipedia, it's this big, long string of text that you might get bored looking at or get just not not interested by the third line, probably. But it's saying that uh, it's writing. Uh, of computer programs uh, with the ability to treat the programs themselves as their data. So shortening this down, it's uh, writing code that writes code, or using code to write code. Uh, how many people use metaprogramming daily? Yeah? If you're using JavaScript, I might argue by the end of this that you're using it every day. Um, but it's, it's writing code that writes code. So things that, the code that I use to write code would be things like my text editor. And this is how I tricked you all into sitting through a talk on Vim. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's code that writes code. So um, one, if you're using more modern JavaScript or TypeScript, you might be using something like Babel or TypeScript uh, to compile or transpile your JavaScript into a version of JavaScript that will run in your supported environments, uh, the browsers and, and uh, different versions of Node. Um, that could be considered met metaprogramming, but we're not going to really talk about that too much. Um, we're going to be talking about the ability for the code to manipulate um, itself at runtime. So if I say that and I'm talking about JavaScript, what's the first thing that probably comes to your mind? Yeah. So eval is awesome. Uh, if you're not using it every day, you totally should. Um, Here's an example of doing something cool with eval. If you're not familiar, it's uh, this really awesome thing that we've had in JavaScript since the beginning. Uh, before we had try and catch, before we had other core language features, we had eval. And it lets us take a string, and it will just evaluate it like it's JavaScript. So in this, I have an object that has a property on it. And then I'm getting values that the user typed in. Uh, from in input one and input two, and I'm setting a new property on foo equal to that value. So I'm writing code, I'm taking input from the user and then evaluating it as full JavaScript. Please don't do this, I'm, I'm totally joking. Uh, there's very, very few use cases for this, and if you are using it and you think it's a legitimate use case, you're probably not writing the best code. Um, sorry. Uh, <laughs> one, one use case might be something like, um, you know, you use JSON, and JSON's really nice. It lets you take your, your data and serialize it into a string and then pass it up or do whatever. But it doesn't support things like functions. So if you wanted to serialize functions um, as objects in, in your JSON structure, uh, you might use something like eval to do that. But again, you're probably not doing something right. So instead, I'm going to talk about kind of a, um, a facet of metaprogramming um, called reflection or reflective metaprogramming. And uh, this is really the, the code's ability to examine and modify its own uh, structure at runtime. And so that's broken into kind of three uh, sub -se subsections. Um, introspection, which is the ability for it to read the structure of the program. Self-modification, uh, the language's ability to change the program's structure. And intercession, uh, changing language semantics. And all of this happening at runtime. So... This is where I'd argue that you're probably doing these three things every day in your JavaScript. Let's take a look at, it, at some ES5 code um, that you might be using. So an example of introspection uh, would be uh, the object methods. If you use the object.keys, um, object.values, object. Uh, several other properties, those are um, metaprogramming that you're doing. You are taking the structure of your program, in this case an object, uh, TV shows, and I'm getting all of the properties off of it. So I'm writing code to inspect my code and get properties off of it, and then I'm looping over them and logging them out. Um, and, and so that's, that's a very simple uh, use of introspection. Another one might be self-modification, so changing the program structure. If we take the same eval example and cross it out, and instead use um, the square brackets. We're changing the structure, we're modifying this foo object here, and we're adding in a new value, whatever the value is that the user provides the, uh, as the key, and then whatever value that they set. Um, we're, we're modifying that, changing it at runtime. So these are things that we kind of 
take for granted. They're just built into the language. You don't think about them as metaprogramming or anything, uh, but they're really nice and really essential to our, our programs. And finally, intercession. Um, this is changing language semantics, so changing the behavior of uh, what's actually happening when you're running your code. Uh, an example would be the ES5 getters. Uh, so if I use a get method uh, and I want to have a get method set up for the property foo, um, I can actually uh, cause it to do something other than just give me back the value of foo. In this case, I have it give me back the value of underscore foo and log something out. So when I actually run this code and all I'm doing is just getting the value of foo and logging that out, first it's going to call my console.log statement and say that I'm getting the value for foo and then log out the value of it, which is true. So I'm changing the behavior, the, the way that the, the language works. Uh, another example of this might be something like uh, using define property and using property descriptor descriptors to change uh, the way the language works. Uh, so in this case, I've got an object and I'm going to define a property on it called foo. So I pass the object to object.define property and I get back, uh, and I'm doing that for foo. And then I pass it this object, which is called a property descriptor to change the meaning of, of uh, the foo property. And I can set things on it. I can set whether or not it's writable. So I can make this a read only property, whether it's enumerable. If I'm looping over it using um, enumeration methods, uh, will this method show up or should I hide it from that? Uh, I can set the value of it. I'm setting the value to just true and I can change whether it's configurable or not. And so when I do that um, and I just get the value, it just acts like any other regular property in JavaScript. I log that out and it gives me true. Now, if I tried to actually set that, um, because I set writable to false, uh, nothing would happen. It would just be true again. It would not be false. It wouldn't change it at all. And in fact, if I was running in strict mode, um, then it would throw a type error on that because it, I'm not allowed to do that. So uh, depending on your, your JavaScript environment, uh, that, that behavior can change. What? No, I'm not. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally there should be a comma there. Thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's, there's several of these uh, metaprogramming methods that are available just on the object that JavaScript, that everything inherits from in JavaScript. So uh, the, it's really nice to, to be able to use those. There's things like keys and entries, which give us these introspection methods. And then there's define property and freeze, which uh, is more intercession. It's changing the way that those um, structures behave. So that's ES5, that's stuff you can use today, that's boring. Uh, what, what can ES insert random number between seven and six and nine and 2015 and 2018? Here, what does that give us? Uh, before we go on, I just want to say, here be dragons. Here are things, I'm gonna talk about some things that no programming environment actually supports yet. Uh, some of these things are available and can run. If you, I, I tried to make the examples in here. Uh, so that you could copy and paste them and paste them into your console in Chrome. Um, most of them will work in Chrome Canary, not Chrome Stable, uh, and Firefox Developer Edition, which are both the nightly versions of those browsers, but not in any version of Node, not in any other ones. So uh, that means that you can't double check my work. <laughs> um, so the first thing that we get in ES whatever is reflect. So this is uh, a series of introspect uh, introspection methods that are available to us. We have these, uh, you can think of these similar to uh, the object object that contains um, reflection methods on it. So object.define property and others uh, exist on there, but they, they want to add more um, metaprogramming methods and, and concepts to the language, but they don't want to add it to the object that everything um, extends from and inherits from. So instead, we get this new object called reflect. You can think of it like math. You have math.pow and math.max um, and, and you know all of those methods that are on the math um, object. Reflect is just like that. It's just a static object that contains uh, reflection methods for us. And so it has some similar methods to object, uh, but they work a little bit differently. Mostly they're just, they behave in a more sane fashion. Um, so if we, for example, we have reflect.define property, and if I used object.define property, 
and it failed for some reason. Maybe it's not configurable and it failed. Um, I, I should have that in a try catch statement because it will throw an error and I'll have to catch that and, and handle it in another way. If reflect.define property fails, it returns false. So I can just do it in an if else statement. So it's a little bit more sane, easier to work with. Um, but these are the methods that reflect currently has on it. We have things like apply, construct, define, uh, delete property, all of these. Um, so let's look at a few of these in a little bit more detail. Um, so first we'll just start with define property. Um, I've got an object called obj, and I'm going to say reflect.define property, and I'm going to define a foo property on the object. So this is just the same example that we had before, where we're making it uh, not writable, so it's, it's a read-only property, and its value is true. And then we're getting back a return value here, and I'm just doing a check. If it was successful, then I'm going to go ahead and try and do whatever I wanted to try and do. In this case, read the value, change, try and change the value. Again, it'll throw an error in strict mode. Um, and then uh, log it out again, and just see that it has not in fact changed. So that's one example. Another one is apply. Um, so if we had a method like this greeting here, um, reflect just gives us a way, ref, reflect.apply just gives us a way to call that method and specify what is, um, what method we want to call, the context of that method, and any arguments we want to pass into it. So uh, I've got that method. It takes in a name and then it's going to look for a greeting on itself, uh, on its context, and then log out the name. So it just says greeting comma name. Uh, and so I have our context that I'm setting to this object here. It has a greeting on it saying hello. And then the arguments is just going to be this array of strings, in this case just one string. And I'll call that. I'll say reflect.apply. I want to call greeting. I want the context that it runs in to be this context. And these arguments are going to be passed into it. So when I run that, I see hello, Nick. Um, so, you know, we, we already have apply and um, by, uh, I'm sorry, apply and call and those methods on function. So why do we need this? I'll kind of get into that a little bit later as I show more examples of this. Another one is delete property. Before this method existed, really the only way to actually delete a property off of an object is to use a keyword, the delete keyword, in fact. And if you wanted to use that like, by calling a method in some way, you had to wrap that call so that um, you could pass in the object and the property name and then just call delete on it, just like that. Well, uh, because there didn't really exist a method to do that, um, that, that was created and added to the reflect API. So we have reflect.delete property, and it behaves in the exact same way as this. It'll delete that property off of there. We also have reflect.construct. So um, this example just has a class that we're creating. This class is extending an array um, and we're just going to construct a new instance of that. So we have this cat list class, and we're just going to call construct, and these are the arguments that we're passing into it. So we're passing in an array uh, that contains two strings, foo and bar, and we're implementing a, uh, the iterator method so that when we uh, use iteration method, uh, iteration operators and methods like the spread operator, uh, it just loops through everything in the array and adds kitty to it. So when we log it out, we see Foo kitty, bar kitty. Um, but if we log out that it is uh, an instance of cat list, it is that, and it's also an instance of an array. So it's, um, or it is an array. We can use the array method to check that. So these are some of the examples of, of methods that are provided uh, on the Reflect API. So that's one thing uh, that kind of covers uh, introspection with JavaScript. Another thing, uh, is symbol. So symbols are added to the language now, uh, and this allows us to kind of do self-modification or change um, constructs in our application or to make them uh, work differently or behave differently in some ways. So what is a symbol? It's just a primitive, just like a string or a number or a boolean, um, but it's completely immutable and it's always guaranteed to be unique, except for when it's not, and I'll talk about that. Uh, but it's, it's uh, a bit different than other primitives. Other primitives, like a number, you can coerce that into a string, or you can coerce a boolean into a string, or into whatever. You can't coerce a symbol into anything. Um, and you create a new symbol by just using the symbol uh, method. It's capital S. You don't use new with it. It'll actually throw a type error if you do use new. So it's just symbol. Um, and that will create a new symbol for us. So let's look at a little bit of usage of that before we dig into the metaprogramming 
applications of this. Let's create a symbol uh, called A. So we're going to create that symbol, and then we're just going to log out A. And this is exactly what it would log out. It would log out symbol, open, open uh, parenthesis, close parenthesis. Now, in uh, the second example, B, we're actually providing a string to that. That string is there to, uh, it's just there for, for tagging and debugging purposes. It's so that when you look at symbol and you try to console.log out a symbol and it just looks like that, you don't go crazy trying to debug, well, where did that symbol come from? You can actually name them so when we log that out, it says symbol, just like that symbol, open parenthesis, some description, close parenthesis. So that allows us to kind of tag them and, and uh, label them a little bit. Um, but these are always guaranteed to be unique. So if I tried to create another empty symbol and compare it to A, it's always going to be false. That's guaranteed. Same thing with B. If I tried to create a new symbol uh, with the same tag in it, those are two unique symbols. They're, they will never equal each other. So um, that's where, where these are nice. They, they're always unique. You can use them whenever you need something to absolutely be unique. Uh, and then this uh, C example is when they're not always unique. Um, so if you use symbol.4 to create your symbol, uh, what that does is it actually checks a global symbol registry, and global meaning global on your page, and in fact, global on your entire realm. If you were running um, JavaScript on a page that contained an iframe, that iframe would be a new realm that contains uh, all new globals and everything. But the symbol registry transcends that, so it will be in there. If you had service workers, symbols in the global registry will be in those service workers. They'll be everywhere. So you can use them everywhere if you need to. Um, but what it does, I said symbol.4 foo. And I, I, you have to pass in a string when you use symbol.4 uh, to, to label that. And what it's going to do is right there, it's going to go check the global symbol registry and check if there's a symbol that is labeled foo in there. And if there's not, it creates one and then returns it for me. If there is one, it just returns the one that was already created for us. So uh, I can do this. I can say C equals symbol dot four foo, and that will return true. So there is an example of where symbols are not equal. Um, we're basically just getting back the same exact symbol in that case. And then there's uh, one other method. We can say symbol dot key for and pass in a symbol to that, and it'll give us back the tag that we created. So in this case, it would give us back foo for C. Uh, and then finally, if we try to coerce it into something else, so in this case we're trying to concatenate a symbol to a string, we're going to get a type error. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, what symbols are. Yeah, question. So is there a compelling reason not to use the new keyword when you're creating a symbol? Yep, because it'll throw a type error if you do. Is there a compelling reason that it throws a type error when you do that? Uh, like, why not have that? Good question. I actually don't know why. Yeah. All objects are new, primitives are new. So symbols are primitive. Yes. So what are symbols good for then? They're good whenever you want to create a completely unique value um, or completely unique property on an object. Uh, so we have, in this example, a registry. We want to create a, uh, we're going to have several components on our page. And we want to create some kind of registry that has access to all of those components um, so that we could do things like loop through them all and, and destroy them or um, check, check a status on them, do, do whatever we want. We just want some way to, to register all of them. Well, we could easily do that. Uh, when we create the component, we could assign an ID to it and make that ID be some kind of symbol. So in this case, I'm just creating a new ID, and this is guaranteed to be unique. So I don't have to hold on to uh, a number and then increment it each time to to make a unique ID or, or use the timestamp or anything like that. It'll just always be guaranteed to be unique. And then you can use symbols as properties in, on objects. So before you could only use strings as properties on objects. Um, in ES Next, you can use symbols as well. So strings and objects. In this case, every time I add a new symbol, uh, I'm sorry, a new component to the registry, it's going to be in there by its unique ID, its symbol. So there's never going to be a conflict with another one that already exists. It'll always just create a new one. Another example might be using symbols um, for values that you, you want to be able to use that you know will never change. Uh, and you want to be able to use them as kind of um, these, these values that you can use to identify uh, what they are. So in this case, I have 
two symbols, success and failure. And then I've got this colors object that contains two, pro uh, two objects, uh, I'm sorry, two properties uh, with their keys being the success symbol and the failure symbol, uh, and then color values. So uh, that's red and that's green for success and failure. And they're backwards. But you didn't see that. You can't check my work, so it's okay. Actually, you can check my work on this in Chrome. Um, so then I have this output met uh, method that's just like a console.log, but it will log it out in whatever color that is. So uh, it just uses the percent %c to allow me to add CSS to it. Uh, so I'm changing the color value of that output on a console.log. And so when I do that, I can just say output and pass in the red symbol, and it'll uh, output that in... Uh, Oh, that should actually be success and failure. You didn't, never mind this example. Um, <laughs> that should be success and failure. So that should be success, and they would log out uh, red, and then failure would log out green. The other way. Yep. That's right. <laughs> you know what I meant, yeah. So um, that, that's a nice thing, that symbols can be used with objects, uh, and they just work really well as properties. So we can do things like add in a method that has a completely unique name, and the only way that we can get access to it is by having reference to that symbol. Otherwise, we'll never get access to it because we'll never be able to create a new symbol that matches that unless it's in the symbol registry uh, that you use symbol.4 for. Um, but yeah, that'd be the only way. So in this case, I have an object that has a method uh, that just returns hello world. And so I can access it here because I can just say object and then pass in the symbol, because I have a reference to it, and then call the method. So those are symbols in a nutshell. Uh, there's also these things called well-known symbols. They're not actually that well-known, so you probably haven't used them or heard of them much. Um, but these are some examples of them. Uh, we have has instance, iterator, match, replace, species, two primitive, and a bunch more. Uh, so these are are well-known symbols, meaning that they're symbols that are defined on the symbol property, uh, on the symbol object, and then you can get access to them from there, but beyond that, you don't really need to know much about them. We'll talk about a few that are super uh, powerful. Um, so the first one is symbol.has instance. If I add a property to an object that has the value of symbol.has instance, uh, then I can set that to a method and I can change what happens when we actually call the instance of method. So here's where we're using symbols to get into a little bit more metaprogramming. We're changing uh, the way that things work. Um, I have this class that I created called my special class, and I defined that uh, symbol, the symbol.has instance method, that takes in an instance, and it's going to return true if that um, instance that we pass in strictly equals the, the string special. So when we log that out, special instance of my special class, that would not normally return true, but it will in this case because we've defined how symbol.has instance actually works. This is one that's actually completely broken. It will return false for both of these uh, in Chrome. So it's, this isn't implemented yet, but it is coming. Um, and then not so special would, of course, return false because that doesn't strictly equal special. So these are just interesting um, ways that you might see JavaScript behavior start changing when things like this start getting implemented. Hopefully it won't be too crazy. Another one is symbol.match. This allows us to create a class or an object that we can use in, in place of a regular expression on string methods like match. Uh, th this one in particular is for match, but there's also replace and search and split. Uh, those string methods that you would normally pass a regular expression to, we can pass an object that contains uh, a method that implements symbol.match instead. So this is super powerful if you need to do something uh, where you would normally use a regular expression, but a regular expression would either be too complicated to do or impossible to do, uh, you can use a function instead to do that. So um, this, was, this would be a normal use of symbol.match. I'm just saying <coughs> string.match, and I'm matching the regular expression foo. Well, this would return what it found. So it found foo as, uh, and, and return that as an array. Now I can use my matcher, I can say that I want to create a new matcher that will look for foo um, and pass that to match, and this would also return foo because it's the same string, it contains it in there, and we're just doing a check. If uh, the string exists in, um, in there, so if the index of it is greater than 
uh, is equal to negative one, we return null. Otherwise, we return the value itself. And then baz buzz bar would, of course, return null because that doesn't have foo in it anyway. Another one would be uh, too primitive. So uh, this, in this one, I'm creating a class called caret or nine, and I'm implementing this method, the string uh, symbol dot two primitive, and this method receives a hint. So this method would receive what you're trying to coerce the value into. So when I have this instance, if I'm trying to coerce it into a uh, a string, I want to return the string caret. If I'm trying to coerce it into a number or anything else, I'm returning the value nine. So I'm changing the way that the um, that the double equals operator works. So if I do something like this, caret equals instance, this would return true, and nine equals instance, it would return true. So it's equal to both of them, but not strictly equal to both of them. So those are some popular ones. Um, probably the most popular and the most useful one is symbol.iterator. Uh, and this allows you to make objects or classes that implement the iterable um, API and allow it to work with iterable methods and um, and operators. Things like uh, the for of operators or the spread operator, the dot dot dot. Um, you can make that work. So whenever we try and take an instance of our class or of our object and spread it out using that, um, we can define what actually happens when that occurs. So this is an example of doing that. Uh, we have this class called Caped Crusader, and uh, in the constructor we're just taking in a length and just setting that. And then we're implementing the iterator method on here. So symbol.iterator. And so the iterator API uh, expects us to return an object that contains a next method on it. And the next method has to return an object that contains a value property and a done property. And so that's all, all it's doing. We're defining what actually happens. So we set a length on here. We're going to create a new instance of Cape Crusader and set the length to 8. And then we call array.from bm, and that converts it into an array, or we just use the spread operator. Both of those work with iterators, so it's taking the values uh, that would be returned like in an array and spreading them out to be individual um, arguments to console.log in this case, so our arguments to the method that we're calling. So instead of passing in an array, I pass in each individual argument. And so that's what we're doing. We're just doing that and we set it to eight, so it goes in here, it gets um, an, a number that it's going to keep track of, so negative one in this case, and then the length, and then inside of the next method, it just increments i, and if that's less than length, then it's going to return uh, an object that contains the value na, and if it's equal to length, it's going to return batman, and if it's uh, not either of those, so greater than, it's going to return an object that just has done, in this case value would be undefined, so um, it's still there. And so when we console.log that out and we spread out uh, those values into console.log, we get na 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 Batman. <laughs> <laughs> so that's symbols and how you can use them for kind of self-modification, changing the way that, that um, things work um, with metaprogramming. The final thing uh, that I really wanted to talk about is intercession or how we can do that in ES Next. Uh, and this is with uh, proxies. So proxies are also a new uh, thing that, com that, are, that is coming to JavaScript. And this is a constructor. You do use the new keyword with this. And it returns an object. We define, uh, when, when we create a new proxy, we pass in uh, a target and a handler. They're both objects, or uh, the target can be a method. It's whatever you want to proxy. And then the handler is an object that contains traps on it. So these are things that we, uh, these are fundamental behaviors that we want to trap and modify so that we can make them do different things or make them do things when they normally would fail or do several different things. So we create that by just saying new proxy. There's also a revocable proxy. So you can say new proxy revocable and uh, that will return an object that contains two properties on it, a prox the proxy itself, and then a revoke method. So if we ever want to turn that off, we can just call revoke and then the proxy will no longer work. But they both work the same way other than that. So an example of proxies. Um, we've got this object. It's called obj. Uh, and it has two properties on it, foo and secret. And then we're going to proxy that object. So we pass in the object as the first argument to it. And then we um, 
define the get trap on it. So the get trap takes three arguments. I'm only using two of them, target and property. And I'm just doing a check. If the property is strictly equal to secret, so I'm trying to access the secret property on our object, then I want to log out unauthorized. This incident has been reported. And console.log returns undefined. So it just returns undefined in that case and doesn't actually give me my super secret value. But if it doesn't equal that, uh, we just return new target. I left off the curly braces to try and conserve space. I don't actually write co uh, code like this. I'm not a monster. Um, <laughs> just trying to, to make things as big as possible. So uh, when I get that back, I now have two objects. I have object or obj and proxy. And I can use either of them. If I say obj.secret, well, I'm not proxying anything there, so it gives me back super secret. Well, that wasn't very nice. So I probably don't want to expose that one if I uh, can help it. But if I tried to get secret off of proxy, it logs out unauthorized, that incident has been reported, and then returns undefined. And um, here I'm just trying to get the property foo off of the proxy. Well, that one doesn't equal secret, so it just returns the value to us and we get bar. So in this case, we're changing the way that we get properties, but only for um, the secret property and nothing else. So this is kind of similar to uh, ES5 getters, right? If I, I could do this with ES5 getters, but the, the catch is I have to set one up for each of the properties that I want to get and then change it. This one is kind of a catch-all. I'm saying that I want, anytime I try and get any property, whether it's a method uh, or a primitive or anything, whenever I try and get that, I want to do a check and see if it equals secret and then change the behavior of that. So it allows me to trap that um, in, uh, in a more global way on that object. So there's several traps that we can use. Um, we've got things like apply, construct, define property, delete property, get, get own property descriptor. These sound familiar, right? Yeah? That's because they map one-to-one -one with the reflect API. Um, so the nice thing about this is if you want to trap a property or trap some kind of behavior on an object using a proxy, and then in certain cases you want it to do exactly what it was going to do, well you don't have to try and figure out all of the invariants and make sure that you're returning the right value, you're throwing an error when you need to, uh, and doing all of these things. If you don't follow all of those rules, it'll actually throw an error on you so you won't be able to do that. Um, to make that easier, you can just call the reflect methods and you pass in, they take the same exact arguments as the proxy uh, traps and they return the exact same values. So you can just use them inside of your traps to uh, do what you want. So if we want to use reflect within our traps, we can do that. Uh, I've got the same, I've got an object here um, that has a property foo, and I'm creating a proxy for it. This time I'm using the set trap and the get trap. And I'm going to say that anytime we call set, I'm going to log out that we're setting a property. So in this case, I say proxy.secret equals super secret, and it logs out setting secret to super secret here, and then it just does exactly what it was going to do originally. So it, I call return reflect.set and pass in the same exact arguments to it, and it's done. It's doing exactly what it needs to do. The get one, this one, it's I'm doing nothing in here. I'm just immediately calling reflect.get. This is just to show that um, th this is the default behavior for traps. If I didn't define get, it would do the exact same thing. But if I define get, I could change its behavior or just make it do the exact same thing. This one is pretty pointless is what I'm trying to say. <clears throat> um, another thing that we could do is um, oh, we can capture method calls. So the, the thing that we're proxying doesn't have to be an object. It can be a function and we can capture that or it can be a constructor and we can capture the construction of an object uh, or an instance and manipulate that in different ways. Maybe cancel it and return a proxy object instead. Uh, or do other things. So in this example, I've got a whisper handler. So this is the object I'm creating. It has an apply trap on it. Uh, so apply, think of it as um, calling a function, right? You can call a function by just calling it. You can call a function by saying function.apply or function.call. Apply traps all three of those. So it doesn't matter if you're saying this method.call, it'll get trapped. Or uh, this method.apply, or just calling the method directly, it'll always get trapped. And so what I'm doing here is I'm taking the target, so this is the function, this is, uh, the this arg is the context that the function would run in, and then the arguments that the function receives. And I am changing those arguments. So I'm going to use the spread operator to create a new arguments list that contains, a, uh, as the first argument in there, and I'm never going to dance again, 
and then I'm going to spread out the arguments uh, that it originally had, and then guilty feet have gotten no rhythm. You probably recognize those, yeah. those uh, strings you, if you were here 10 minutes early. Um, and then I'm just doing exactly what I expect it to do, which is call the method. So I'll just return reflect.apply and do that. So when I do that and I create a new, um, a new proxy wrapping a method, uh, in this case, here's my method here. I'm using the, um, the arrow syntax in ES6. So it looks a little weird, but it's, I'm taking the spread out arguments uh, and I'm, or the rest of the arguments. So I'm condensing all of the arguments into an array. And then I'm just calling console.log and spreading out those arguments. So I spread them all out and print them out. So when I call whisper here, and, and I do all of that inside of, I called a new proxy, pass in the whisper handler, uh, to define all of the traps, in this case, just apply. And then if I just say whisper user created successfully, uh, it prints out some George Michael lyrics. Now, wouldn't you all love to do this in, in your applications? Wouldn't it just make going to work and looking at your logs so much better? You, I, I didn't have enough space to do an ASCII George Michael. I would have done that otherwise. So uh, we have all, all of those things, and we can put them all together now to create... Uh, something really, really fun to use. Um, so in this, I've got a module I'm creating uh, that's just an object. It's just going to define the traps that I'm using. In this case, it's called dirty handler. And I'm going to define a construct um, handler, uh, I'm sorry, a construct trap on there. Construct is the trap that's used when you try and create a new instance of something. So I would use this on a, uh, to, to proxy a class in this case. So um, when I do that, I get the target. This is the, the class that we're actually trying to create and the args. Uh, that's the arguments I pass into the constructor. And then I'm going to create a set. Uh, set is an ES6 data structure uh, that allows us, it's, you can basically think of it as an array that always, all of the values in there have to be unique. So if I add more things to it, um, it'll, it won't add them basically. It'll just always be a list of, of unique values. Uh, and then I'm creating a dirty prop, and I'm using symbols for that. So I'm using these, these properties, these new ES6 things, um, all in one example. It's crazy. Um, so I'm using symbol.4 because I want to use the symbol registry. I want to be able to access this outside uh, from anywhere, really. And then inside of the constructor, instead of returning a new instance of the, the target that I was passed in, I'm returning a new proxy. So I'm using a proxy within the proxy, and I'm just going to call reflect.construct. So I construct it like normal, but I'm going to proxy the thing that I construct so that I, I can change things on that. And in this case, I'm setting, uh, I'm, I'm trapping set and get uh, on that constructor. So anytime I try and set a property, what I'm doing is I'm uh, going to just take the property and set it. So in this case, I'm not using reflect.set. I'm just doing it like I normally would. So I'm saying target property name equals value. That's just how you would normally set a property on an object. And then I'm adding the property name to our dirty set. So I can keep track of and say this value has changed. And then I have to return true. Because I didn't, um, because I, I didn't use reflect.set and return that value, I have to match the API. If I did not return true here, it will throw an error telling me that it expected me to return true. So I'm returning true. And then on get, all I'm doing is just doing a check. If the property name that I'm trying to get is equal to the dirty prop, so it's equal to that symbol that I've defined in here, then I want to return the dirty set that I have here. Otherwise, I just want to do the regular thing and return um, the get. So I call, use reflect.get to do that. So this is the, the uh, traps that I'm setting, but I'm not using proxy anywhere in here except for internally. Um, to actually use this, I'm bringing it into another class or another module and using it. So uh, bringing it in, it's called dirty handler. And then I'm creating a class called model. And in the constructor for that, I'm just taking the arguments that are passed in as an array, and I'm just going to loop through each of them and set those properties on my instance. And then I'm setting up a, a ES5 get method for, uh, for the dirty property. And I'm just going to, instead of looking for a property called dirty, I'm going to look for um, the dirty symbol uh, value that I have. So the, the value that exists at that symbol. And then I proxy that to give me a new class called proxy model instead of model. So I'm passing model to that and dirty handler. 
and then I get that new model back. Now I'm creating a new instance of the model here and I'm passing in George Michael to it. So two arguments um, and those get set in the constructor here. But they, and then what I'm doing is I'm setting model.foo equal to bar. So I'm adding a new property to it. And then I'm changing a property uh, that I had. I'm changing George to false because it was just defaulted to true when I set that in here. And then when I log that out, I see the dirty properties that I have are foo and George. So this is just an example of using proxies, symbols, and the reflect API to keep track of properties that change on my model so that when I go and try and save this uh, by doing like an XHR request or anything, I know exactly what properties have changed and what properties I need to send up with that request. Uh, and I didn't really have to build anything in. This is a reusable proxy uh, that I can use on any other model uh, or anywhere else and keep track of that. So putting it all together makes for some pretty useful code, but it's doing a lot of things that, you know, you're just writing regular JavaScript and it's, it's doing these, these things kind of behind the scenes. Um, so it's, even if you have no intention of using this, it's something that a library that you use in the future might start using. So it's good to know that this magic might start happening where you never expected it before. So that's all to say that there's lots of new and shiny things in JavaScript. Uh, we talked about reflect, um, so introspection, symbol, uh, self-modification, and proxies, intercession, and there's others. Um, some examples of others are decorators that uh, are coming to the language. They're already in TypeScript. And there's a um, proposal for a metadata reflection API. So you can use that inside of, um, inside of things like decorators and others. Uh, to set metadata that can be read and used at runtime. An example of this is if you use the um, if you use the shim for that uh, it, TypeScript. If you're compiling transpiling TypeScript to JavaScript, uh, it can actually set metadata about what those types were when it was TypeScript, and then you can read that data out at runtime in JavaScript and know information about that. So it sets things like uh, the types of all of the arguments that are passed to a method, the return value, the expected return value of the method, uh, and the, the type of the, the value itself. So lots of new cool things uh, coming to the language. So definitely check it out when things start working in places. Thanks.